In common applications, ductile materials are considered to fail when yielding occurs. That is, when plastic or permanent deformation occurs. Three of the main ductile failure theories, called yield criteria for failure under static loading, are the maximum shearing stress, also called Tresca, distortional energy, and the coulomb moore criteria for ductile materials. For some of these criteria, we'll use two additional concepts, the three-dimensional state of stress and the expressions for normal strains using Poisson's ratio. The maximum shearing stress criterion, or Tresca, states that yield will occur if the maximum shearing stress exceeds the maximum shearing stress generated during tensile testing. When these dog bone shaped tensile specimens are subjected to tensile testing to obtain the stress strain curves that we've shown several times before, both the yield and the fracture of the specimen will happen in slanted planes within the microstructure of the material that have a 45 degree angle and that are commonly known as strip lines. If we look at a stress element that is subjected to tension only, and we look at the stresses generated by that sigma y on a stress element that has been rotated 45 degrees, we can easily use the Mohr circle to identify the stresses that are affecting the rotated element. If the stress element has been rotated 45 degrees in a clockwise direction, the angle of rotation within the Mohr circle would be 90 degrees from its original stress state. The new normal stress is half of the original value in both x and y, and the shearing stress vector has a counterclockwise direction. Since the yielding occurs at the strip lines, we know that what is causing the failure is actually the shearing stress exceeding half of the yield strength. Now remember that the more circle diagrams with only one more circle in them only happens when we're looking at plane stress elements. For 3D stress elements, the third normal stress sigma z is usually zero. So our Mohr circle diagrams should show three principal stresses. If we look at the three Mohr circle diagram possibilities, both principal stresses are negative, both are positive, and one of each, we can see that for every stress element, we are missing the given stress sigma z equal to zero. Our three-dimensional state of stress and the corresponding Mohr circle for each one of these cases can be completed with the sigma z equal to zero, where there's a distinction between the in-plane maximum shearing stress and the overall maximum shearing stress. Only for case two, where one of the principal stresses is negative and the other one is positive, the in-plane maximum shearing stress would coincide with the overall maximum shearing stress. Since the maximum shearing stress criterion states that yield will only occur if the maximum shearing stress exceeds the maximum shearing stress associated with the yield strength during a tensile test, we always use the overall maximum shearing stress. For most failure theories, we often use the convention of sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 for the principal stresses where sigma 1 is always greater than sigma 2 greater than sigma 3. Following that convention, it is easy to see that the overall maximum shearing stress is always equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 over 2. This means that if we're using the maximum shearing stress criterion, we don't want sigma 1 minus sigma 3 to exceed the yield strength, and that the factor of safety can be calculated as the yield strength over the difference between sigma 1 and sigma 3. If we assume that the yield strength is the same for compression or tension, which is in fact an assumption of this criterion, we can draw what we call a stress envelope with positive and negative yield strength values in the sigma A and sigma B axes. Sigma A and sigma B refer to the two principal stresses from the 2D Mohr circle from the 2D stress element, and they are interchangeable. Within the stress envelope, we can locate our in-plane principal stresses location. If we draw a line from the origin that passes through that point, the factor of safety is defined as the distance of the segment that goes to the boundary of the envelope divided by the length of the segment from the origin to the principal stresses location. For quadrants 1 and 3, this ratio is just a ratio between the yield strength and the larger principal stress because of similar triangles. For quadrants 2 and 4, where one principal stress is positive and the other one is negative, the boundary line is a straight line of slope 1 and y-intercept equal to the yield strength. x is equal to sigma a and y is equal to sigma b. Since we want to stay within the envelope, we can define the factor of safety n 
and therefore this stress envelope is consistent with our general equation for the maximum shearing stress criterion, even for quadrants 1 and 3, where one of the sigmas is 0. The second yield criterion is called distortion energy. It tells us that yield will occur when the distortion energy per unit volume exceeds the distortion energy per unit volume for yield in tension or compression. The strain energy is related to the resilience of the material or the area under the curve for a stress strain curve. The strain energy per unit volume up to where yield occurs would be the area of a triangle. Experimentally, most ductile materials are seen to withstand higher stresses when all three axes are subjected to the same value of stress. This is commonly known as hydrostatic loading. Since any combination of three normal stresses can be obtained by adding a hydrostatic component and a distortional component for any triaxial stress, the strain energy that will cause failure will be that of the distortional component. Looking at the strain energy of the triaxial stress, and since the axial strain will be affected by Poisson's ratio and the orthogonal stresses, the expression for each strain will depend on all three stresses and the elastic modulus, as well as Poisson's ratio. If we substitute the values of the strains in the strain energy equation, factor the elastic modulus, distribute some of the values and realize that there's two of each pair, we can use this expression to find the strain energy in the hydrostatic component by replacing sigma 1, 2, and 3 with sigma average. Simplifying this expression, and since sigma average is sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 divided by 3, we can substitute this expression in sigma average to find the distortion energy by subtracting green from red. Looking at the resulting expression from this subtraction, we can recall that during a tensile test, the specimen will fail when sigma 1 reaches the yield strength, and that that sigma 1 is our only normal stress from the tension, the distortion energy that causes failure, in this case yielding, would be equal to 1 plus nu over 3 times the elastic modulus times the yield strength squared. This means that the distortion energy for any case should never be higher than the distortion energy during tensile testing. In other words, that the stress on the left should not be higher than the yield strength. This stress on the left is what we call the von Mises stress and we use sigma prime for it. For a 2D stress element, at least one of the three principal stresses will be zero. If we substitute the other two by sigma A and sigma B, and this can be done with any of the three principal stresses, we can identify that this is the expression of a rotated ellipse if x is sigma A and y is sigma B. This is the equivalent stress envelope for distortion energy. The factor of safety would be the yield strength over the von Mises stress. Finally, we have the Coulomb-Moore criterion for ductile materials. This one is used with those ductile materials that have a different yield strength for tension or compression. For example, some magnesium alloys. The stress envelope is similar to Tresca with a negative compression yield strength on the negative axes. In this case, the straight diagonal line has a slope of ST over SC and an ST as the y-intercept. X and Y are still sigma A and sigma B respectively. Knowing that we want to stay within the envelope, we simplify this expression and we define the factor of safety as 1 over the left hand side. Notice that we did this for quadrant 2 where sigma B is positive and sigma A is negative. This makes sense because the positive stress should go with the tensile strength and the negative stress should go both with the negative sign and the compressive strength. This expression can be written in terms of sigma 1 and sigma 3 so that it works for any of the four quadrants. Let's take a look at an example for Tresca and distortion energy and if you want to check out more complex examples, including some of the Coulomb-Moore criterion, make sure to check out the two minute example videos linked in the description below. An aluminum component is subjected to some plane stresses that we found after performing a combined loading analysis. Link to that 10 minute combined loading video below. We'd like to know the factors of safety for this critical location. We know that the average is 90 megapascals and that the radius of the circle is 100 megapascals. Link to that more circle video also down below. The principal stresses would be 190 and minus 10. The more circle would show us where sigma 1, 2 and 3 are 
and the expressions we derived today would help us calculate the factor of safety for both the maximum shearing stress and the distortion energy criteria. The von Mises stress yields a 195 megapascal stress and therefore the factor of safety would be 1.41. The factor of safety for Tresca would be 1.375. We would not be able to use the coulomb moore criterion since the yield strength is the same in compression or in tension for the aluminum. It's worth pointing out that even though the factor of safety is smaller for the maximum shearing stress criterion and therefore it's a more conservative criterion, Experimental results are much closer to the distortion energy criterion and therefore the distortion energy criterion is usually preferred. The links to the other 10-minute lectures of the Mechanics of Materials course as well as the other examples of failure criteria are linked down below. So make sure to check those out. Thanks for watching.